everyone and welcome to the hangout we are at a very 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 cool time in the year the tucson show is just about to happen in 10 days i travel there so you're going to see some great content meteorites from all over the planet i'll be able to show you and that's going to be more of a commerce side of the house but we are really truly dedicated to science here and when Daniel Shea, classifier to the stars, showed up today, we we're like, yeah, we got it. We got to squeeze him in, even though uh, he wasn't scheduled. So uh, we have the From the Lab um, series. I mean, I've been very fortunate to have uh, Daniel share with us some of his information, some of his classifications. Uh, and I don't even know what interesting sample he has for us today, but he offered a From the Lab episode with an interesting sample. And he's a friend of the crew. So, Daniel, thank you very much for joining us, buddy. Thanks for having me on, and thank you again for uh, managing to make time to squeeze me in. Is this a sample from someone on our crew? Uh, yes, it actually is. Okay. And uh, <laughs> uh, before I get started, uh, it was interesting when I made this that I I didn't know whether this was episode three or four, and that's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, what that tells me is that I need to get more from the lab episodes out for this channel. I know the last one I had was quite a number of years ago, but now that I've officially become a PhD candidate, I've got through a lot of hurdles with the academic papers and processes. I have a lot more time to classify meteorites and make attend more hangouts and make more presentations. So 2025 is off to a great year for the From the Lab series. And for this particular one, I hope not to disappoint. Uh, so just for starters, this was sent to me by none other than Pat Brown, who is in the audience today. Very and nice. this was a suspect type 3 unequilibrated ordinary chondrite, or type 3 OC, as we call it. Uh, this was sent to me for a classification. And the primary focus was on doing subtyping to determine if this meteorite was a low subtype. Now, for reference, a low subtype are very primitive ordinary chondrites that have are what are known as petrologic types of between 3.00 and 3.15. And what that means are that these samples are essentially what we would term the most primitive of the ordinary or in general of the chondrite samples that we have. Hence, they're very important for doing any kind of scientific research because they have seen the least amount of modification after these rocks were assembled. Now, this was a co-classification that I did with Pat Brown. And essentially, what I'm going to first discuss is some of the findings that Pat had seen, also some of the findings that I saw when I did geochemical work. And then I'll talk about another technique that we used, which has been gaining quite a lot of popularity, I've noticed, in terms of classifying chondrites. So uh, what you're looking on the left, these are what are called backscattered electron images. So when I classify samples, I make thin sections of the material, just very thin slices. I put them in a scanning electron microscope. And when I look on a computer screen of what I'm seeing from the sample, I see sort of these grayscale images. Now, just to give sort of a very quick definition of what these images can tell you, these can give you a sense as to the texture of the sample, and these can give you a good sort of understanding of what minerals might exist in your rock. Now, just to get you up to speed, when you look at these, you might see a lot of these round shapes. These are chondrules. And on the bottom, there's a scale bar right here. So uh, Pat essentially measured the chondral diameters of uh, from sections of the rock from, uh, not from this, but just from looking at the sample. And I also measured the diameters of the chondrules in the SCM. And so combining the two, we got a similar result. And so the chondrules are about 600-ish microns, but there's a large spread. And you can tell quite a bit because you have some very large chondrules and you have some very small chondrules. So of course, you're going to get a large spread and how large the chondrules are. Now, an important thing to note is you'll see I say most chondrules have what are called devitrified glass. Now, when chondrules form, they uh, consist of large crystals of olivine and pyroxene and this what is called a mesostasis or a glass, and then it quenches. But when you start modifying the rock, which is when you go from a 3.00 to a 3.5, 3.6, 3.7, 
by what's called thermal metamorphism, which is just heat being on its parent asteroid. The more you modify the chain, the more changes you get in the primary chondral chemistry. And one of the signs that you can tell right away just by looking at it is the presence of devitrified glass. What that means is that the chondral mesostasis has now transformed or devitrified from a glass into different mineral phases that start to crystallize out of that glass. And so you might not see it from here, but if you look at this chondral right here, and you look at this chondral right here, if you look in between these large, these are grains of olivine and pyroxene, these little grayscale grains. If you look in between them, you start to see these tiny little, almost looks like straws. And these are just crystallites of new minerals that form from that mesostasis. So this chondral has seen alterations. So has this chondral. Now, for reference, what primary glass looks like uh, if you look at this chondral right here, you can see sort of this one uh, light gray color and all these dark grains in here. That's what a primary glass looks like. So the first thing I noticed when I saw this sample is that this looked to be not the lowest subtype three. That's sort of the first thing I noticed. Uh, these are a couple other backscattered electron images of the sample. You'll notice there's a lot of chondrals. But you'll also notice that there are different colors of the chondrules. And that just corresponds to the fact that you have chondrules that have different chemistries in them. And on the SCM, when you take these backscatter electron images, they're very sensitive to the chemistry of whatever you're looking at. So whatever is dark has a different chemistry than whatever is brighter. And so I use this to try to navigate and find different chondrules and try to get the chemistries and minerals from those chondrules to get a good sort of overall sense of what I'm looking at whenever I classify. So now what I do is after I've taken those initial backscattered images, I zoom in on chondrules of interest, and then I take another image, and then I take what's called a chemical map, which looks just like this, where I'm essentially using an X-ray detector to pick up X-rays uh, from different elements that are in my sample, and they can give me a great resolution image on where I have certain elements, which I can use then to tell me what minerals are in the sample and where I should take my spots when I do my chemical analysis. So for clarification, this, this false color map is geared in a way where phases like olivine and uh, low calcium pyroxene, which I need to get points of for classification, tend to be sort of these green phases. Uh, that just means that they have a lot of magnesium. That's what the green is. And then phases that are very bright, that are pink, tend to be phases like the chondro mesostasis, which is, or also phases like plagioclase feldspar, which you can get them in uh, ordinary chondrites, but they're not relevant particularly to the classification. So I use these maps to find where olivine and pyroxene are, and I get points of those. That's where you see all these little spectrum spots right here. These are just points that I get with my X-ray detector. And from this, I was able to get the geochemistry of the olivine. So when you go on the Metrical Bulletin website and you see the geochemistry, you see something like this, where you see the phalite, which just means roughly how much iron is in the olivine relative to another element like magnesium. You tend to see a value like this. And what this value means is that the average phthalite content of the olivine is quite variable across different chondrules, which is why you have a large spread. And I looked at about 93 different grains, probably about 12, 14 different chondrules. And you can tell this right away just by looking at that there is variable olivine chemistry throughout the sample. Now, what's very important when you're doing a subtyping is you have to look at the distribution of one particular element in olivine called chromium. Now, chromium is a very sensitive indicator of thermal metamorphism when you start heating up the sample and you go from a 3.00 to a 3.15. And that's because as you do that, as you start heating up a very primitive sample, the chromium in the olivine migrates and forms a new mineral phase called chromite. That's an oxide phase. And so when you look Right here, you'll see that I've got about 0.1 weight percent of what's called Cr2O3. It's just chromium reported in what's called oxide weight percent. That's just how geochemists report this. And this value is lower than what you'd expect for a low subtype ordinary chondrite. In fact, the threshold of when you start to get into that 3.15 is roughly about 0 0.19, 0 0.2, sometimes higher. And for this, I looked at quite a lot of olivine grains, 
Uh, I think I looked at 91 because two of these grains uh, didn't uh, meet the threshold. But basically, I looked at a lot of olivine grains, and the average was that I didn't have much chromium in that olivine. And that's because, if you remember from earlier, I showed a lot of chondrules had had that devitrified glass. They had seen some uh, metamorphism. And the first sign that you get during metamorphism is you begin to lose chromium from that olivine. So that's why the value here is low, which also fits with the fact that this is not a low subtype. But having said that, this is not a high type 3 subtype either, because once you hit 3.6 and 3.7, your olivine composition, so this phthalite value, begins to equilibrate or reach one net value. And so the fact that I have this large spread and composition tells me that while I'm not at a 3.15, I'm not at a 3.8 either. I'm somewhere in the middle. And the fact that I still, in a few chondrules, preserve primary glass tells me I'm probably a 3.4 to 3.5. So this was how I was able to notice that this was a this subtype right away. Now for the final thing that I need, it's the it's the group. I know I have an ordinary chondrite, but do I have an H, an L, or an LL? When they're equilibrated, it's very easy to distinguish them based on the olivine phalite and the pyroxene for us light if you have H, L, or LL. But if you have a type 3, it's very difficult because in, then you have to rely on things like chondral diameter, which isn't always the best sign. So in comes this magnetic susceptibility meter, or what's called the MET-MET. This is a great instrument out there for getting the magnetic susceptibilities of meteorites, which you can actually distinguish HLs and LLs very easily using this device. And they're just reported on the on the Metbull website in what are called log X units. Uh, don't ask me what those are. I don't really study my next susceptibility, but this is how they're separated. So Pat uh, measured a log X value from a large individual, about 400 grams of about 4.49. For reference, this is between LLs and Ls, so it doesn't tell you too much about it in terms of whether it's L or LL, it's just somewhere in between. And I measured it on a small 10 gram slice and I got 3.98. So we actually got slightly different values, which is interesting. And from what I got, mine fit in the LL field. But the fact that he had a very large individual and me measured many different points, that's that value also should be a relatively good value. And the fact that it wasn't at L or LL, but somewhat in between, told me that we're probably, at least for this sample, it's most likely LL, but we can't fully distinguish it as LL given that uh, you know this value isn't exactly in the LL field. Out of curiosity, man, sorry to ruin your flow, but you got my answer. Where, where is the cross, is it four, is it four log units? Is that the crossover? So it's actually interesting. So it depends who you ask. Uh, the most the most recent paper has the crossover. I think you go at the edge of LL at about 4.1, and then there's a big gap, and then you reach, sorry, from LL at the top, and then you reach L when you're at about, let's see, I think it's 4.7 or 4.8. might be a little lower, but the another thing that you have to also look out for whenever you're doing magnetic susceptibility is that these samples have been sitting in the Sahara Desert for a long time. And so when that happens, phases like iron metal, they begin to alter, turn into iron hydroxides, and then the overall magnetic susceptibility of your meteorite goes down. So what they found is that the more weathered your sample is, the lower your actual value is. And so you can get L-chondrites that have magnetic susceptibilities all the way down to like 4.5. But those are for some of the most extremely weathered samples, but it's still possible. Yeah. And so when you get a value like 4.49, some may question and say, well, it could be that maybe you have a very weathered Saharan meteorite find and you're still L. But then if you have a value like 3.98, you know that, well, you're still much lower than that and you have to be in the LL field. But, and because we are getting different measurements on different samples, you may question, well, it's only a 10 gram piece versus a 400 gram individual. But it is important to, to mention that whenever you're measuring uh, that I found with this device, on larger samples, I've tended to get slightly higher log X measurements for some reason uh, versus uh, smaller five to 20 gram you know, pieces. So there could be something else going on in there, which I think should be looked at further. Uh, but because overall, uh, comparing this with things like the chondral diameter, 
which for L's and LL's, there's sort of this overlap, you know, in terms of what the average diameter is from what people have found in papers. The safest thing to do is if, if there's no definitive, you know, answer as to whether it's L or LL, it's important to just leave open the possibilities of both, but you can give a preference. And so for, for this sample, uh, I have two sorts of ideas and I'm going to submit this sample later today, but I'm thinking I'm either going to do LL and then open parentheses L. What that means is that LL is the likely group, but it still could be L. And then three just means that it's a type three, or I'm going to do it as LL slash L, which means both of them are, you know, possible uh, for the classification. So I'm still kind of thinking about which of the two I'm going to do, but so far that that's the, the two classifications I have proposed for this sample. But it, if there's one thing that I'd like to just say about this is that it really highlights that even when you uh, classify samples and you're doing as much work as you can on this, sometimes you're not really able to narrow it down to the exact group. And so if you're asking me what would be the next approach, that if there was something else I could do to narrow it down, well, then I would do something like oxygen isotopes. But oxygen isotopes, of course, uh, can be quite expensive. There's a long waiting time. And so at that point, you ask yourself, is it worth going further? Or am I content with knowing that it's likely an LL3, but it could be an L3? And that's sort of the point uh, that we're at with this sample, that we're content with the results that we have on this sample. That is super so interesting. It's a really cool thing uh, with classifying overall. That is. That's Wonderful awesome. work, Daniel. Thank you. No problem. And happy for Pat that Pat is a co-classifier in this sample uh, and on future samples uh, that you sent to me as well. And uh, this is just ending off with another inquiry. If you need, if anyone needs samples classified uh, to please contact me at this email. Uh, now that I have more time to do classification, I'm going to be uh, getting a lot of samples submitted this year, uh, some that I've had uh, since last year and the year before, but uh, I'm hoping that this will be a very big year uh, for meteorite classification. I've noticed that there are uh, more people starting to classify meteorites now, which I think is great. Uh, yeah. I have noticed some more techniques, which I do have some questions about uh, those techniques, but uh, I am glad overall that there is a higher demand for getting samples classified. So uh, feel free to contact me and uh, I hope to get Hopefully this year, I hope to get over 80 samples classified closer to 100, but but we'll see. Congratulations, man, uh, on all the all the recent successes you've had. And thank you for, for um, educating us, stopping by, and allowing us to use your likeness on our channel. <laughs> um, this, this is great information, and um, I love the fact that, that we have access to the real deal classifiers that are actually doing this day in and day out and can talk about the nuances of it um, because the, the the vitrified glass and and how that gets you a little bit closer and then the chromium how that gets you a little bit closer and it's just tiny little hints or clues it's really like sherlock Holmes putting a a, a mystery together is is the way i like it so uh exciting and thank you very much i appreciate it um guys have a great week bye-bye Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel.